Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor James, and I want to welcome you to this gathering of Pioneer Baptist Church Sunday service. Today, we're going to be looking at the book of Acts, chapter 13, and we're going to get started back into our series through that book. I'm excited about it. But first, let me go ahead and tell all the fathers who are watching out there today, thank you. Thank you for what you've done to help uh, provide for your families. Thank you for what you've done to lead them spiritually. Thank you for what you've done uh, as God's servants to the church. Uh, man, you guys have done so many things. God has given us mothers. God has given us fathers. Each of them has a specific role to play in our society and uh, in development as children. And I wanna thank you all for being there and being a part of that. Many of you will recognize right away that one of the great crises in our current culture is that we have broken homes. Now that burden is upon both men and women. However, uh, God has ordained it that the men are to be the leaders in the household. And so for those of you who are leading well, I am especially grateful today. And for those of you who feel like you may have misstepped along the way, maybe you didn't lead as well as you could have, I want to explain to you today that we can rejoice that God is able to overcome and forgive our sins. There's not one of us walking on the face of the earth who's perfect, and each one of us has the opportunity to worship the one true God, the great father of us all, the one who is perfect, and the one who can shape us into what we were created to be. So today, as you celebrate your families, I just wanna encourage you, uh, support and encourage your fathers, uh, for they are very special in God's plan for your life. Let's pray, and then we'll get into our service for today. Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we ask that you bless the reading of your word, help us to hear it, help us to understand it, God, there is nobody that can give us truth. No one can give us direction. No one can give us help besides you. And so, God, as we draw near to you right now, we ask that you'd allow us to learn from you. Let your Holy Spirit teach us. And may your word be lifted up as we lift up Jesus and as we lift you up to be praised. Oh, God, you are so worthy to be praised. Help us, Lord as we draw near to you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray expectantly. Amen. All right, so grab your Bibles. If you're not already there, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13. For many of you, this might be your first time viewing our series through Acts. Uh, most of our sermons are available digitally, or uh, there are quite a number of them now on YouTube as well. Um, just let us know if you'd like to hear some of the other ones. But basically, to catch you up, the book of Acts is a historical book. It tells us about how God established the church early on after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. It explains to us the transition from a Jewish-centric religion to a global religion. We get to see as God slowly unfolds his plan through the apostles, through people who were gathered to worship at a Jewish holiday, as people received the gospel and as they sat and listened to Jesus' teaching, as relayed to them by the apostles, they went out to the four corners of the world and people began to be saved. As a natural result, churches are formed. And through the book of Acts, we begin to see what our churches maybe should look like. Now, I will be the first to tell you that what we find in the book of Acts is not necessarily prescriptive for what we're supposed to be doing today. There are a lot of situations that are raised that are not consistent throughout even the book itself, whether it's the laying on the hands uh, of believers to unbelievers so that they can receive the Holy Spirit, or whether it's something as simple as what officers are actually available within the church, or whether it comes down to how do we send out missionaries? Who is qualified? How do we know? Um, those things vary also throughout the book of Acts. But what we can see is a general theme that is very important for the church today. 
very important for the church today. If you've been with us for a while, you'll have heard this before, but I want to remind you again, and for those of you who haven't heard, here it is for the first time. God uses normal people to bring about his kingdom's work. He sets people apart, not special people, not high-ranking people necessarily, normal people to do his work. And that means, as you listen to me today, God is telling you he has raised you up to do his work. What a great encouragement and what a daunting mission. What a daunting mission to know that we serve the one true God. But good news, good news, all he requires of you is obedience. Anything he calls you to do, he will also equip and empower you to do. And we're going to see that some today as they send out Paul and Barnabas on their very first missionary journey. And so let's turn to the book of Acts and let's see what God has got for us as we propel the church forward. Now we have went from Jerusalem, right, to Judea and Samaria, the surrounding areas of Jerusalem. Now we've went over to Antioch, which is northwest up on the coast, which is where this story takes place. And we're going to go to the uttermost parts of the world. And we're going to do that in a way that we wouldn't normally think uh, about doing it. Uh, we would think about taking a person and sending them to every city strategically. In fact, that's one of the ways that we try to send missionaries as a Southern Baptist convention these days. But what they're actually doing here by God's guidance, and maybe his sovereignty is all that's at play here. Maybe they knew what they were doing, but they were going to the Holy Roman Empire that wasn't holy yet. They were going to go to Rome and Paul is going to find himself there in just a few chapters giving the gospel to the world leaders at that time, the high-ranking thinking people at that time. Paul was going to be taking the gospel to a place that was connected over the entire European continent. So the people who got the gospel there were going to go to all the four corners of the earth, just like happened in Jerusalem. You remember when the Holy Spirit was poured out? God had called everybody back to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, the Passover, um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And everybody was gathered together, as all the Jews were from all over. They had gathered together, and the Holy Spirit fell, and many people got saved and took the gospel back with them to wherever they came from. And now what Paul's going to do is he's going to go to an epicenter of social interaction and um, power, and he's going to deliver the gospel, watch it grow, and then it's going to scatter to the four winds. And do you know that one day... That gospel is going to make its way to the shores of America. It's going to trickle down through the generations like a little stream sometimes, like a raging torrent sometimes. And it's going to land in places like Crawfordville, where you first received the good news of Jesus Christ. It's going to end up rolling south a little farther down to Gainesville, where I first heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God, his church was obedient back then as he empowered and equipped them and called them. And it is still the same today. We get to pass that gospel message on today. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Let's begin. Now they were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. This is really just an introduction to how Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas in this story, got set apart to do missionary work. Uh, we're going to go through this series of verses real simply. We're going to look at the history of what's actually going on. And then at the very end, we're going to draw a couple of points that we can take away for us today. Number one, um, I want you to notice where this took place. They were in Antioch. Now, if you remember, Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. The Antioch church was started by a bunch of basically uh, non-ethnically Jewish, Jewish believers 
So they were people who weren't born Jewish, but believed in the Jewish God, who were in Jerusalem, received the gospel, and because of where they lived or because of what God had done in their life, we're not sure exactly, they went to Antioch and they started preaching. The church started to take root there so increasingly uh, fast and so wonderfully among both the Jews and the Gentiles that news made it back over to uh, Jerusalem that God was doing something great in Antioch. So the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas out there to check it out to see what was going on. And of course, he started encouraging them and blessing them immediately. He went up to Tarsus, which is north, uh, about 100 miles, and he grabbed Paul, Saul, and he brought him back down. And for about a year, they taught people at Antioch. Um, and after that year was up, they heard through a prophet that a famine was coming and that the brothers in Jerusalem were in need, that they were going to be suffering a lack because of this drought. So the Antioch church took up a collection and sent Barnabas and Saul back to uh, Jerusalem to deliver this gift. <clears throat> and that's where we left them off. They delivered the gift, and then we cut to a story about Herod the Tetrarch and how he had brought, brought glory to himself and how God struck him down uh, because he was not giving glory to God as he was supposed to. Herod the Tetrarch had also killed James, the brother of John, and he was going to kill Peter, but Peter was delivered miraculously from prison by the Holy Spirit, or by a spirit of God, by an angel of God, and he was delivered and he went on his way. Now, here we are back in Antioch. Saul and Barnabas made it back. And what was happening is they were all gathered together and they were praying and working. Now we're going to get to that in just a second. But I want you to notice, secondly, that's Antioch. That's the place that we're at. We're, this is like the new hub of missions for the Gentile Christian church. And Antioch is sending people away, uh, out as missionaries. Antioch is growing disciples. Antioch is hustling and bustling. But we get commentary right here about what kind of leadership was available at Antioch. Now, we're not saying that this is exhaustive because we don't know. It's not an exhaustive list of all the gifts of the church right here. But what we do have is we said that there are a couple of people there called prophets and a couple of people there called teachers who are at Antioch. And then it lists five of them. It talks about, uh, let's see. Let's see, who does it say? It says, uh, first of all, Barnabas. He was a leader. but there And, and it says Saul. We're going to get to them, but those, those are two of the five. But there are three other leaders there. A man named Simon, who is also called Niger. We don't know much about him. Uh, there's not much in the Bible telling us about who he was, but he was a teacher or a prophet. He was a leader in the church. There was Lucius of Cyrene. That was clearly a Gentile guy, and he was a leader within the church. And then um, there was Manan who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. What m many scholars believe is that this was like an adopted brother of Herod the Tetrarch, the guy that God just killed for taking glory to himself. God had also infiltrated that home and saved his brother or his companion or his servant, whoever he was. But he was, the Bible tells us that he was with Herod the Tetrarch and God had saved him and brought him into this church at Antioch. Maybe it happened when Herod was struck down just a chapter ago. I don't know. But he was a leader in the church. He was a prophet or a teacher. And these men were exceptional, right? But let's ask ourselves real quick, um, what is a prophet and what is a teacher? Because these are things that were in the church from the very early stages. Well, a prophet is a person who foretells God's word and his desires for people. It's really like a very practical application of what God has said. Throughout scripture, prophets oftentimes will tell of future events so that we'll know that God was in them. Basically, they're telling the future. Um, the Bible says in the Old Testament, if a prophet predicts the future and it doesn't come to pass, that they are to kill that prophet because they are a false prophet. So there's a bit of a weight to making the future forecast, but that's not all a prophet is. A prophet's not just telling the future. The prophet is foretelling God's word, his truth. He's like a preacher in a lot of ways. And um, he tells people to repent Oftentimes, he says, turn to God. This is his main message. Even if he does foretell future events, the prophet foretells these events so that people will know that they need to turn to God. The prophet is the one who calls people to repentance based on their sin and future judgment. There's a lot of other things a prophet does. I mean, because that could be considered somewhat evangelistic as well. But I want you to see also what a teacher does. A teacher 
is a person who actually relays known information to a group of people. So a teacher is a person who takes known information and he transfers it or she transfers it to another group of people. And so they were teachers, people who were gifted at transferring the information from one source to another in this church. And they were prophets, people who were willing to stand up and declare, thus says the Lord, you need to do X, you need to do Y. These are two fundamental things that we find in the church. And oftentimes, our modern day pastors have to play both of those roles. We have to be able to teach you what the Bible says and just transfer knowledge, kind of like we're doing today. It's almost like a history lesson. Um, we have to tell you what the Bible says and what you need to understand about it so that you can teach others the, the source of our hope, so you can teach others our heritage, so you can teach other our, others our doctrines and theology. But you also need a prophet, someone who gets up and is not scared to say, you need to act differently. You need to do different things. And this is something that is, uh, again, a very hard thing to do. It's hard to balance a line between being a teacher and being a prophet, um, just from my perspective. But I, but I just want you to see that these guys were in the church. They're helpful for the church. They're gifts for the church. And each of these five men were under this category. They could both tell you what to do and they could tell you why we are telling you to do it. Um, they're definitely gifted teachers. And this is what was going on at Antioch. Um, they were also about a certain work. Did you notice what it says when they, when the Holy Spirit spoke to them? It said that they were uh, ministering before the Lord and fasting. Now there's some debate as to what ministering before the Lord actually means, but down below it as a, as a, a ending to the Holy Spirit's sending, it says after they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on the, on Barnabas and Saul and they sent them out. And so I would like to offer up the suggestion that at the very least, what this is talking about is fasting and praying as leaders of the church. Um, oftentimes, again, this is not prescriptive. I want you to know this. This is not prescriptive. But in this instance, in history, God chose to use people who were fasting and praying and seeking his face, doing the work of the, uh, of the church. So they were teaching people about God. They were calling men to repentance. They were busying themselves with helping the poor and supporting those people who needed help in their faith. They were dedicated to serving the less fortunate. They were dedicated to serving the church and they were about their work and they were in their, they were in this attitude of fasting. And I'm not sure exactly why that's important here, but the combination of prayer and fasting seems to avail us to hear God when he's speaking to us. And I just want to encourage you today, if you have never prayed and fasted for an extended period of time, I'd like you to try to adopt that into your life. If you have any questions about how to do that, I'd be happy to talk to you about it later. But I just want you to see historically, the, this missionary journey was fostered out of a spirit of fasting and praying. They were listening. These five leaders, particularly, were listening to God. They were listening for God, and they wanted to work where he wanted them to work. And God, in his Holy Spirit, set them apart. So that's what they were doing. They were fasting, and they were praying. Fasting, real simply, is denying yourself food for the sake of dedicated prayer and seeking God's face about a specific issue. It's not about weight loss. It's not about self-discipline. You can use those things for weight loss and you can use those things for discipline, but fasting, spiritual fasting, is about seeking God's face for a particular issue. And that can be done regularly. Um, it could be seeking God's face for, God, what do I do next? And I think that's kind of what these guys were doing here. And so fasting and then, of course, praying is talking to God, speaking to him about what's on your mind, speaking to him about what's going on in the world, asking him to bless people, heal people, save people. There's so much to pray about. And that's another thing. If you have any questions about, I'd love to talk to you about how to pray more, uh, more biblically or more confidently as you approach God in the days to come. So in, the, in, the, in Antioch, this historic, growing, awesome church, there were five main leaders. They were fasting and they were praying, and the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Now I want you to notice this. This is the first time in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit sends somebody. Up at, until this point, we've seen um, Philip um, get sent to the Ethiopian eunuch by what the Bible calls the angel or an angel of the Lord. When Paul was converted, we see Jesus come down in a holy fashion and speak to him, 
he says, who are you, Lord? That's what, G that's what Paul says. Who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus who you're persecuting. Then you have the Spirit sending Philip again on another missionary journey, the Spirit. So you have an angel of the Lord, you have Jesus, then you have the Spirit, and then you have uh, Cornelius on his prayer time seeing an angel of God telling him that to go get Peter. And then you have Paul and Barnabas, I'm sorry, then you have, uh, yeah, Paul and Barnabas being sent out by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, you have uh, Philip again being sent out by the Spirit of the Lord. Um, so you have these different names for the for the Godhead that is sending these people out to do these work listed in the book of Acts. But this is the first time that the word Holy Spirit is used. And now many of you know that the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, is the gift of God that is dwelling inside of us. He is God's presence inside of us. It is, according to the New Testament, a down payment on the promise that God will one day take us to be with him. Because he gives the Holy Spirit, we have God with us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to do the work that he's called us to do. And I just want you to notice here, Paul and Barnabas are about to embark on a great journey, and they are being sent by the Holy Spirit himself. Now, do all these spirits and angels and people who gave these messages before in Jesus, do they all correlate to the same being? Well, yeah, according to Trinitarian theology, yes, they're all the same being. But I want you to notice that here particularly, the author says the Holy Spirit set them apart. And then what they did after they set them apart is they laid hands on them. Um, now it says they didn't lay hands on them immediately. After the Holy Spirit spoke to them, they fasted and they prayed some more. Uh, one of the things I want you to understand and just think about with me is that they're drawing attention to the action that's important. This is how we draw near to God. As Christians, we can still draw near to God and hear his voice for our lives, for what we're supposed to be doing today. And that comes by fasting, and it comes by praying, and it comes by seeking his face. And brothers and sisters, sometimes it takes a long time. We're not told how long they were doing this or how long they did it after they were set apart. All we know is that the Bible is clearly pointing out before and after their calling that these people were praying and fasting. So I want to encourage you to make this a part of your life. Now, uh, they laid hands on them before they sent them out. Now, a lot of times we can think of uh, this as a symbolic gesture. Uh, it, laying on hands or uh, putting the mantle on somebody else is a visual uh, connection to other people that power or authority is being transferred to someone else. And so what the church is doing here, at the very minimal, it could be more, it could be something spiritual going on, um, but at the very minimum, what is going on here is that the leaders of the church are in the eyes of everybody else. And just even if it was just the five guys, we don't know if it was public or private. In the, in the presence of the five guys, they're saying, look, we are conferring authority onto you. We trust you. We are sending you. We are going to support you. We are going to be behind you. We are going to follow you. That's what happens when you give people authority. You follow them. You trust them. And so they're laying hands on Barnabas and Saul and saying, we trust you to go do the work of the Lord. And we're sending you to go do what the Holy Spirit has set apart you to do. And I want to tell you that as people are specially set apart to do the work of God, in this day and time, it is extraordinarily important that we support them, that we trust them, that we send them, that we lay our hands on them and say, we will join you in this. We are giving you our authority. You're our representatives as you go out. Now, really, they're representing the kingdom of Christ, but we get to be a part of that sending mission. What a wonderful thought. And as we get ready to go into our business meeting this week, and as we get ready to consider how we can support and fund missions in the future, think about this as we think about God's special calling, his special setting of part of certain people, because we need to be involved and we need to be supporting those kinds of people in our lives. And finally, they sent them out. Uh, they left. They were no longer in Antioch, the safe space. Uh, they were going off on an adventure to strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no Christian had gone before. That's where they're going. They're going to go hit up a couple of islands, and then they're going to get up to the mainland, up closer to Rome. Um, and those are going to, we're going to talk about that in days to come, but they went. And that's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? God calls us, God sets us apart, but we have to go. Because the story never becomes a story if we never go. 
All it is is another missed opportunity, another missed adventure, another failed responsibility. And so what I want to encourage you all today is that we're not Paul, we're not Barnabas, we're not those three leaders in the Antioch church, but God is still working the same way today. So what are we going to take away from the message today? What are we going to take home with us? Well, number one, a church is gifted apart from apostles. I just want you to notice that God's doing all this work through the Antioch church that was established by regular people. They had regular people in positions of leadership, and God was using them to send off the apostle Paul on his missionary journey. These, this church was highly functioning without Paul's leadership. Now, Paul helped, but they were already rocking and rolling. They sent Paul to Jerusalem. They're sending Paul to some other place. They're just sending him, and they're growing where they're at. Today, our churches are the same. We don't need some big named leader, some apostolic figure to tell us what to do and where to go. We have God's mission before us to preach the good news, to teach people all of God's word, to let them know who he is, to bring them up in the image of Jesus Christ and to send them out to do the work wherever God sends them to go. We do that with the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I just want you to know that the church leaders... Um, can still hear today, and you can still hear today too, a clear message from the Holy Spirit when you're fasting and praying. So not only can our churches function like the church at Antioch today, but we can also still fast and pray. That's not something unique. That's not miraculous. And the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us is still speaking today. So maybe he wants to set apart you, or maybe he wants you to help set apart someone else and to equip them to go. We should definitely be in prayer about those kinds of things. And then finally, it seems like this is not prescriptive, but oftentimes in our churches today, the Holy Spirit sends people out through the leadership of the church. It's not all the time. Sometimes people just are raised up out in the middle of nowhere and they go and they preach their message and God blesses them tremendously because God's hand and gifting is on them, whatever. But there is an awful lot of people, a large majority of people, who will never go out unless they're sent by the local church. And I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit still sends its missionaries through the local church, and that these local churches have authority, the authority of God's word and the authority of his church. And when they put that authority behind a missionary and send them out, it means that they're going to equip them and trust them to do a work that God has set them apart for. And that means that when that missionary goes to wherever they're going, they're not all alone. They have not been abandoned. They have somebody behind them. And I think that that may not be prescriptive for every situation, but it is a very efficient and very helpful thing to recognize as we look at how the first church missionaries were sent out and how they were equipped. And so, brothers and sisters, today, I just want to tell you, God is still speaking. So pray and fast. God is still sending. So ask if you need to be sent and ask if you need to send somebody else. Keep your eyes open. The work of the ministry is going on because Paul and Barnabas and these leaders were obedient to go forward and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We're recipients of that gospel, and it's our job now to pass it on to the next generation. I hope that you'll join us with that. If you're here today and you haven't ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you about how to do that. And if you're a Christian today, I hope that you'll experience fasting and praying for the first time this week in a long time. I hope that you'll dedicate yourself to listening to God and see what it is that he would have to say to you. I hope you all have a great week. I love you very much. I'm going to say a short prayer and then you'll be done for the week. God bless and keep these people. Provide for all of their needs. Help them to be bold in trying new things. Help them to be bold in believing your word in faith as they try to do fasting and as they try to do praying more often. Lord, I pray that they would not be hardened of heart, but that they would expect great things from you and that you would use Pioneer Baptist Church to bless your kingdom, to grow your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to have avenues to support missionaries. Help us to have avenues to send missionaries. God, we ask that you just bless us and help us to be a part of your salvation history. We love you, Lord, and we look forward to what you're going to do through us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, y'all have a wonderful week. I can't wait to see you. 
uh, next time. By the way, Pioneer Baptist Church is open 1030 on Sunday mornings in Wakulla County. Come and see us.